Glenn, you look pretty tired. Did you get plenty of sleep? Oh, I only got like four hours of sleep too, so. But I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. So. So. Phil, you didn't put a curse on this new technology stuff, did you? So, because uh, <laughs> I like the old-fashioned way too, but I like the new technology stuff too. So, we're going to be uh, in session two, um, talking about the Amish culture and values. And I've taught this several times, and so I know somewhat about this stuff here. Um, that first session was is really really tough for me to do. Um, because, number one, I'll admit it, I don't know that much about history. And so, um, because it's my fault, I don't read that much about it and all that. I wish I would, but <clears throat> don't get time to take the time to do it. And so this session here I'm very familiar with, and it's a session that I can uh, relate to and so much with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, go to about 12 o'clock. I know the time is on the schedule to be off at 12.15. But I'm, I'm going to try to cut it at 12 o'clock if I can, and then uh, we're going to eat lunch and just fellowship. we got food out there. I know some of them probably has to leave after a while. Then after lunch, they're going to play music out here, and that's the cue to get out here to get ready to go. And we're going to have a little bit of preaching. And uh, Glenn Yoder from Missouri, the great state of Show Me State, right? Show Me State. He's out there in Cahoka, Missouri. Preaches at Bible Baptist Church, Independent Fundamental Baptist Church, and uh, he's the one that uh, took Polly and him and Ida took Polly, and they've been such a great blessing to us, but I'll give you a little bit more of that in the introduction when I bring them up here. So we're going to get into session two on culture and the values of the Amish. Birth, early childhood happens, uh, this is the early childhood, Amish families have an average of seven children per family, although it goes up to, it's not uncommon for a family to have 13 children to have 19 children. I know a family that had 20, 20 children from the same father and mother. There's just big families. It's not uncommon for a family to have that many. And then there's, uh, but the average usually is around seven children per family. We're getting ready to have our seventh child. And people wonder if we're still Amish or not. Yeah. No, we're not Amish. We left the Amish. But, uh, and so we, um, we don't believe in birth control. I still don't. And the Amish, that's one thing too, they don't, they don't believe in birth control either. Children are often born at home in the Amish families and uh, in birthing centers for the following reasons, like such as midwives, this stuff like that. I know my mom had me in a hospital in Hicksville, Ohio, and then she had 11 more children. They were all in a birthing center, which was just at a midwife's facility. So mom had them away from home at a birthing center. Then the youngest one, uh, Amos, uh, he just turned uh, 16 in July, he uh, was born in a hospital as well. So the firstborn and the youngest were born in a hospital in my family. So it's not uncommon for them to, uh, to have home birth or to have a, a birthing centers. They do not carry medical insurance since most have 7 to 16 children. Hospital bills can be quite expensive, so they don't have insurance, so getting quite expensive for that. But you know, today, I, noticed, I know that today, uh, I come from a sect of Amish people that they didn't have Insurance, but there's many sects of Amish people, um, communities that have insurance, and it's a, a, a nationwide sort of insurance that the Amish hold within themselves. I just talked to my cousins about a month ago down in Owensville, Kentucky. Their barn burned down last year. Well, they had insurance, which shocked me. Well, it was Amish aid insurance. It's, um, it's insurance amongst the Amish to have insurance, which I think is a pretty good thing. And then comfort. The reason they have the uh, birth at home is for comfort. The home environment offers more comfortable and flexibility, and uh, and 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 I can ex and I can uh, vouch for that too because our first three were born in a hospital, and you're so much under pressure, and you have you're a number at a hospital, and so our last three and our fourth one, uh, uh, last three, and then the seventh one is going to be born at home, and so it's so much more relaxing. That's why they did it too. That's one reason is for comfort, and then the Amish is also for care. Amish lean more towards midwives and doctors who are used to helping them and better understand Amish culture than nurses and doctors in stressful and routine hospital settings. So those are three reasons mostly why they have is cost, comfort, and care that they have. And the pregnancies and where babies come from are in, most, are in most cases only discussed between the adults. The father and the mother usually discuss uh, with that, with the, about the babies or to their married siblings. They don't discuss it with their children. For example, Polly. 
she never, her, she never knew which end the baby comes out, just to be quite frank with you on that, until I married her, and I had to teach her from what I knew, because she didn't know how it goes about even to make a baby. And so the Amish young girls are not taught how, uh, how that takes place and how God created that and uh, uh, how beautiful that is. And, so, and, the, and the sad part of it is my wife's uh, mother was a midwife. Uh, Polly's mom was a midwife, and Polly didn't know nothing, and she was 27 years old when she married me, and uh, Glenn is still unhappy about that, but anyways, um, Glenn married us, and Polly lived with Glenn's, and Glenn's adopted her as her daughter, pretty much, their daughter, but anyways, when, when the young children turn five years old, they begin to give work responsibilities, such as carrying out firewood, mowing grass, and helping with the fire, farm chores, and that's exactly right, I was um, seven years old when I was scraping out hog pens, with 40 hogs in the pen, seven years old with my five-year-old brother shoving us and putting us down in two inches of manure. Two inches of manure. And, and uh, we had to scrape these, these floors were um, uh, sloped, and we had to scrape this all out and everything. We were taught to uh, work at a young age. I had back problems at eight years old because I was carrying two five-gallon buckets of slop to the hogs. And I had back problems at a young age because we were taught to work. I remember milking my cow for the first time. I was seven years old. Remember it as clear as day when I went out to milk at seven years old. And we got a cow right now. And she's going to be fresh any time. And Rebecca's going to be seven this week. So I'm thinking about that. But anyways, uh, Amish schooling. Amish schoolhouse is typically one large open classroom with a basement to a house to, to house a furnace and firewood. Basement, usually one section of the basement, a lot of times houses the firewood and uh, the, the stove that brought the heat up. Now, in my case, where I came from, I had a one-room schoolhouse with one floor, and then we had a curtain right down the middle of the schoolroom, and we taught grade one and four on one side and grade five to eighth on the other side. We only had an eighth grade education. That was the school setting in that. In the classroom, of children were split in two sections, like one, the fourth grade, and five to eight, like I explained, in some cases, Amish send their children to public schools for various reasons. They, uh, uh, some, uh, this is more common in communities in Home County and Ohio and northern Indiana. Uh, some of them send their special needs children a lot of times to, to public schools. But it's, uh, my grandfather, he was uh, raised, uh, he was lived in Adams County, Indiana. He moved out in 1954, that's what I remember. But before, he was 15 years old, so he went to an English school. This is kind of before the Amish became uh, parochial schools and before they came separate. So they, they went to English schools a lot of time. But later on, I don't know if it's in this session or the session tomorrow, I'll explain a little bit how the school separated from the Amish. But in some cases, Amish send their kids to public schools. I shared that. And some Amish homeschool their children. Some Amish homeschoolers children in education, community, we got community involvement. Oftentimes, an Amish farmer in the community will allow the schoolhouse to be built on the property without charge. My uncle, for example, he had uh, several acres, and so he lotted off like two acres, and he sold it. He didn't really charge anything to the community, to the church, and we fenced it off, and we built a schoolhouse on it, and that's the way it is in most Amish settlements like that. The community pays for, pays for and maintains the cost for the schoolhouse, and so each family is charged for uh, school bills, they got a school bill, and they got to have to pay for it, pay for the teacher. Then you got education. Students start school at the age of six and graduate with equivalent of about fifth grade education. I know when I left the Amish, I went to do the GED classes, and so I only had an eighth grade education. I uh, graduated school right when I turned 15, and I know when I went to do GED class after I, uh, after I left the Amish, I wanted to get my GED. I didn't finish it. I didn't get it, but I know they graded me. They graded me on my... Uh, equivalent of education, I don't know what you would say, but uh, on some subjects I had as much as ninth grade education, and some I had as much as fifth grade education. I forget what my fifth grade education was, but I, I, I just that's how they uh, gauged me to see what I needed to finish my GED. And uh, it was fifth grade, and the highest was ninth grade. So, But I didn't pursue it on because I had my own business, and I didn't feel like I needed a GED to do my own business, and I'm doing quite well by the grace of God. Amen. So I thank God for that. By the time a student reaches the second grade, he or she is required to speak the English language at all times while school is in session. Those who get caught speaking the mother tongue are disciplined. I remember we were not allowed to speak our mother tongue, which was Swiss or Pennsylvania Dutch. We were supposed to speak English, and we were not really taught English until we went to school. I know I learned how to speak English somewhat before I went to school at seven years old because Dad would always have English people come over, and I would learn how to speak, and that's how a lot of them learn how to speak English. But our mother tongue was... 
uh, either Pennsylvania Dutch or uh, some form of German, in other words. Student lessons are graded with a letter grade of A, B, C, or F. Too many Fs in a school year will fail the student and require the student to take the same grade a second time. I remember if you got five Fs, you flunked. You went down to the next grade the next year. It was just that simple. So we worked hard not to get an F, and some of them didn't work hard. I know that I had several kids in my grade that had flunked twice and were in my grade and went down below me. So that happens all the time. It's not the education is not so... Uh, like it is today in the public. Of course, I don't like the way the public teaches. They, they teach weird stuff anyways. But in, in today's age, the way we teach in the homeschooling, the biblical way of homeschooling, like for example, our Rebecca and our Malachi. Malachi and Rebecca. Rebecca has been getting up with me every morning for the last two months before I go to work. She makes sure to get up. I don't wake her up. She gets up. She's not even seven yet. She'll be seven the seventh of this month. She gets up every morning with me and she reads the Bible with me very clearly. She knows how to read. She knew how to read when she was four years old because we kept materials in front of her. Malachi, he wants to now get up, and uh, he wants to uh, do it. So he's been starting to do it now every the last uh, week, and it's uh, it's it's uh, it's just amazing to listen to them uh, uh, read. And I'm trying to think what word did he use? It started with an E X in the Bible, and he related it to an excavator. <laughs> There's no excavator in the Bible, but he said excavator, and he went on reading. But it's so interesting to do. I don't criticize him. I just say, no, this is what it says, you know, and I just be patient with him, let him read. But I can't explain to you the joy that it puts inside of me to listen to my children read. I just, it, just, it just excites me to listen to them read. I, I just, I just I, I love it. And then when the education differences between them and what we are putting before them, is amazing at the level that they know, and that's the way it is with a lot of um, Bible-believing uh, families that have children. And what I'm, the reason I'm saying this is last year we went to an Amish auction just down the road from us, and my family was there. Matter of fact, my nieces and nephews were there that were same age as my children, and they are same age as Rebecca and Malachi, but you could tell the biggest difference. They're not taught what my children taught. They, don't, they, they acted like three-year-olds. They acted like three-year-olds. It was just amazing. I seen it firsthand. It was just amazing. And so they don't t send their s children to school until they're about six or seven years old. The Amish school day is divided into periods covering the various subjects such as lunch. Two recess periods for, um, I mean, the covering various subjects. Then they have lunch for recess and two recesses periods for playing outside games such as volleyball and kick, and kick can, goose, uh, Andy over and all that stuff. The school usually averages from 15 to 40 students. Usually when it got to 30 or more, they would split the, the room and make it so it's two, two, uh, two rooms and two teachers. Two reasons for eighth grade education. And then also teachers, I didn't share about the teachers. One teacher typically handles all eighth grades. Sometimes she is provided with an assistant. And in most cases, the teacher is a female and single, sometimes just having graduated from the school that year. I know I had eight sisters, and every one of my sisters taught school. Right after they got out of school, they taught school. They only had an eighth grade education, so they just taught school. And every one of them taught. Eight sisters taught. A teacher is selected for showing good and moral character, Christian values, and for having an interest in teaching. And some of my sisters had interest, and some of them didn't. On a rare occasion, a new community might hire a non-Amish teacher until they have one of their own to take over. And I know a lady that uh, goes to church in uh, Community Baptist Church in uh, uh, Lapeer, or, uh, uh, Cross... Man, I can't think of the name of that town up in Michigan. Lady that goes up to a Baptist church up there. We did a conference up there one time. She's an older lady, and she taught in an Amish school. And she was English, and she was a Bible believer. She taught in an Amish school. Until they heard that she shared the gospel with some of the children, she got kicked out. She got kicked out. But two reasons for eighth grade education is, number one reason is practicality. Amish believe that eight years of classroom training provides a child with enough schooling to survive and make a decent living in the Amish career. Now, I don't know who all has heard about this, but in 1972, it was uh, the state of Wisconsin versus Yoder. I don't know that much history about it, but I know the public wanted to get those Amish to go to the public school. And so they went, they went all the way to the Supreme Court. Am I not right about that, Glenn? They went all the way to the Supreme Court about this, and they finally ruled it out that the Amish could have their own schools. And so... They, because they, the public wanted them to get 12th grade education, and the Amish believe they only needed eight years of education. Amish recognize that they and the world as a whole need doctors, bankers, lawyer, law enforcement, and other professionals that college and universities produce. However, they do not need 
They do not see a need for such learning and career aspiration in their own culture. I know growing up, I often played uh, cops and robbers when I was a child, and I always made a wooden CB out of a piece of wood, block of wood, and a wooden gun. I always desired to be a cop. I always loved, uh, loved, loved law enforcement. I always desired to be a cop. I never figured I could be a cop. And, uh, but because it was like, you don't, the Amish don't do that. You only do farming, carpentry, homemaking, or whatever. That's just a few things that you do. You don't even think about being a cop. But I remember doing that. But I had the privilege after I left to run for sheriff in our county. So that was interesting in itself, even though I lost, but it was still interesting in itself. And reason number two is religion. The Amish feel higher education can lead a person away from their religious upbringing and the community. And I can go on and on sharing testimony upon testimony on how the Amish, when they leave, you get accused of knowing too much about the Bible. How can you know too much about the Bible? But because you read the Bible and understand the Bible and, you ex you, and the Amish get saved and they understand and they find freedom in the Word of God, then they say that's too much Bible. It's too much learning of the Bible is what they say. And then religion is not offered or taught in school. Religious teaching is typically left as a matter for the church and the home. So when you're Amish, we separated God and work. As today... Um, as believers, everything is one, right? Everything is from God. In other words, what I mean by that is, I'm th I thank God that I have work. I am blessed that I have work. But the army separated that. On Sundays, it was God. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday was just work and was just worldly. It, wasn't, it, wasn't, it was like they didn't really appreciate that they had to work on Sunday, or uh, to work and all that stuff. Whereas today, if it wouldn't be for God, it wouldn't have nothing. If it wouldn't be for God, if it wouldn't be for what Christ Jesus did, I wouldn't have anything. And so that's what they felt like at that time. It's offered, and then it's not taught, our doctrine is necessarily not taught in school. What we're taught in school is how to speak German, how to read German. We spoke Swiss, we spoke Pennsylvania Dutch, but we had to learn how to read German. That's the only thing that we were taught. And the only thing I really knew about the Bible before I got saved is I knew, and, and, and this is, Weird that in Corinthians uh, chapter 13 is the love chapter. Is it second or first Corinthians? Second Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter. First Corinthians. First Corinthians there you go. First Corinthians is, is the love chapter. That's all I knew. It's a love chapter. It's just a charity about charity. And so I didn't know anything. I didn't even know about John 3:16 until I left the Amish. And so religion is not is not offered or taught in school. Anyways, let's go on here. Teenagers. At home, between ages 14 and 17, young men are taught their father's trades. Young women are mentored and taught how to grade, cook, clean, do laundry, and make meals. And then at church, the teenagers must join the youth group until the age of 16 or 17. At the young age, Amish are considered old enough to start to dating. We dated when we were Amish. And at the age of 17, youth usually got, get baptized and join the church. And this age varies from different communities, depending on where you go. But by the time you got baptized, we had to follow the eight. We had to learn the eighteen articles of faith. Some communities um, they um, did confirmation or whatever you would say uh, for six months. The Swiss did it for a year, and so we would uh, sit under the the preachers uh, in a separate room at every church service, and then they would make us say the article of that day of that Sunday. So we had, oh, somebody had to take a turn of that. There might be five. There might be six uh, youth that were what they would call following church or whatever, and then we would sit in a room and we would say our articles, and then we, there's another saying that we would say that was German and had some kind of religious thing to it. On Sunday evenings, the youth meet at the same house in which church services were held during the day to sing German songs. This service is called a singing. So we, we always look forward to go to the singing when we were 16 or 17 years old. That was a highlight of our life. And so there were just several things that were a highlight of our lives when we were young, and that is, First, we were get to baptize, become a member of church. Second thing I looked forward to was getting married. And so there was a two main things that we looked forward to as an Amish young teenager is that getting, becoming baptized and then becoming married as a, as a young man. Dating and marriage is that marriage are not put together by parents or the church, although some believe that there, that is the case, but it's not. Partners have to marry within the same fellowship. For example, a member of the old order Amish is forbidden to marry a member of the new order church, new order Amish. I know part of my testimony is in 2009, I got, uh, got to talking to a girl in Davis County that we were not really in fellowship with, and we were not fellowship with them, matter of fact, and so I tried to uh, uh, date her, and we did for about a month or so, but the church had a problem with it. They said that they, because they have modern things, they have um, uh, hanging cabinets, which we were not allowed to have, they have indoor plumbing, which we were not allowed to have, 
And then they had gas lamps, which we were not allowed to have. And they read the Bible every morning, which we never did. And so, therefore, they're too modern, and they had air, which was in Davis County. You guys were from Davis County. And so that's, that was that one. So I had the church came to me and they said, I have to break up with her, and that ain't going to work. But thank God that happened, because I wouldn't be here today with Polly if that wouldn't be the case. Amen to that. And then weddings. Um, weddings is before a person can get married, he or she has to be baptized as a member of the church, and that is true. We had to be baptized in order to get married. Sometimes young teenagers, 16 and 17 years old, would have uh, sex, and so they couldn't get married. They had to get married, but in order to get married, they had to baptize them. Sometimes there was incidents where they baptized them that day and married them the same day, but they could not get married unless they were baptized. Just because they got, uh, had a wedlock, so they had to get married. That was the deal that they had to do that. Weddings usually take place in springtime or the fall and are traditionally held on a Tuesday or Thursday. And there's just so much more there that you could read in your book there if you wanted to. Funeral services and burials. During the time that a deceased body is in the home until the time of the funeral, the Amish will not leave the body unattended. At least three men will stay up all night until the body is in the ground. Now, I'm not familiar with the three men. I'm familiar with the youth staying up all night with the body. They stayed up all night with the body. Then another group would stay up the next night while the other group went resting until the day of the funeral. Nobody would be, not everybody would be sleeping. Somebody had to stay up with the body. For some odd reason, I'm not exactly sure why that was like that. That was a tradition that we had, that we always held. Funerals are held in Amish homes, sometimes in big pole barns. In the summertime, a large funeral can sometimes bring as many as five to 800 people. It's up to, much, up to 1,000 people sometimes. And then the women always wear black in funerals. They always wear black, and sometimes they, if it's a family member that died or a close family member, they wear black, and they wear black for six months, sometimes a year, sometimes for a couple years in honor of that person that died. For example, even when the Amish leave, when a family member leaves the Amish, they wear black. To this day, my mom is still wearing black because I left the Amish. On Sundays and church is where they wear black. Not necessarily at work, day at home, or anywhere they go. But three days before the funeral takes place, relatives and friends will gather at the home and, de- and the deceased of the home of the deceased during that time, people hardly talk, and when they do, it is in a whispering voice only. And, I, and, I, and how true that is. We always just whispered. And, and then during the time when the funeral, when the funeral took place, before, and when after, after everybody ran out, after everybody walked through the casket and went out, the family would gather around the, the, the casket, and they would just bawl, and I mean wail, and just cry, and just cry. And I always hated those times because it was such a sad time, and it just freaked me out as a young man doing that. I mean, it would be for 15 minutes to 20 minutes. Sometimes they would just bawl and cry like that. And then burials, caskets are made out of wood, and the vaults usually made out of wood as well. Family members and friends gather around the open grave while four pallbearers lower the casket into the hole and fill in the dirt. And you know, that's one thing that I think is a good thing from the Amish, uh, in my opinion, is that when they bury somebody, they bury them down, and they stay there, and they cover them up. In the English world, as you go into the you go to the funeral, uh, you go to the uh, grave site, and you have your services there, and you leave, and then they bury it. Well, I experienced with Joanna is that when we left, our kids were saying, what happened with Joanna when we were leaving? It just broke my heart. We went, and I called the funeral director, and I said, look, uh, can you just, before you cover her up, can we come back? And he said, yeah. So we went back, and we watched him put her down. And so we watched him put her down, and so that gave us closure. That gave us closure, and, and I, I didn't realize it at the time, but that gave us closure, and I think that's the one thing that the Amish do, that when they do that, they do that kind of in the right way, in my mind. In my opinion, is it gives you closure when they bury them, and uh, we, we went and did that. We went back there, and they, they, it gave us closure, and it gave the children closure. They never asked anything more after that, so I was blessed about that. The Bible speaks of Jesus appearing in the east, and they bury the body with the feet pointed to the east. And their head to the west, because it speaks of them appearing in the east. It speaks of Jesus appearing in the east. So the, they always made sure the heads were pointed to the west. And those, and I remember going past English graveyards, and I'm wondering why don't they have them all pointing to the west? You know, but it, because it doesn't matter. Those who pass away while excommunicated from the church are buried outside the cemetery fence without a headstone. Now, that is true for a lot of sects. They take the ones that leave the Amish, and when they die, and when they, get, when they get buried back into the Amish cemetery, they bury them outside the fence. I don't know if that is the case with us. I'm not going to get buried in that cemetery anyways. I'm going to get buried in an English cemetery. It's going to be in the dirt. It doesn't mean anything. But what I wanted to say is we're going to have a guy here supposedly tomorrow, ex-Amish guy, and I'm going to have him share his testimony. And his dad had left the Amish, died, and they buried him in the Amish cemetery, and they buried him way away from the actual cemetery, Amish cemetery, and put him way over there in the corner. And his dad got saved right before he died. 
And so this guy got saved too, radically changed. And uh, his name's Eli Yoder, so I'm hoping he's going to be here tomorrow. I thought he's going to be here today, but I'm going to have him share that story as well because it's real. The burial sites is the Amish have their own cemeteries, usually located in an open corner hayfield. A short distance from the main road, the area of the cemetery is donated by the Amish farmer, usually is what happens. Now we're going to get into mentorship here. Yeah, this glitch thing is not working again. If I wait too long, it doesn't want to work. Mentorship, father-to-son relationship. Father works with their son at the young age in order to teach them to work ethic. Fathers teach son their, teaches sons their work trade. By the time a son reaches the age of leaving home and getting married, they have, for the most part, learned how to run their own business and support a family. For example, um, it was encouraged for us to wait to get married until we were 21. And my dad, in his era, in the 70s, when they got married in the 70s and early 80s, my, dad, my dad's dad, which was my grandfather, if you got married under 21, you had to stay home until you were 21. My dad got married at 19 years old, and um, he had to stay home in a, little, in a little house, and he had to work there until he was 21 years old, and he had to milk the cows. Dad and uh, Grandpa had 20, 25 cows they had to milk. Dad had to stay there with his young wife, which was my mom, and me as a young baby. I remember we lived in a 12 by, I don't remember that, but I uh, know that we had to live in a 12 by 16 little shack that Grandpa had on the flayster, and Dad had to stay there until he was 21. And a few, a few trades that are very common among the Amish include dairy farming, sawmills, blacksmith shops, woodworking shops, and carpentry. That's all we knew, cabinetry, all that stuff. And then a mother-to-daughter uh, um, mentorship was a mother will work with daughters to teach them daily duties of the house. By the time the daughters reach the age of getting married, they are, for the most part, know how to do things and run a home. On her own. Mothers teach their daughters how to bake, cook, and clean. And there are just several things there. The Amish involvement in the world is that voting is very rare in the Amish community. I know growing up we never voted. It was never thought of as voting. That's for the English people. That's for the heathens. That's for the lost people. That's how we looked at it as. But uh, only around 10 to 15 percent of the Amish people cast ballots in presidential elections. Now, I have several uncles that moved out of my community and went down to Owensville, and there's now like 80 to 100 families in Owensville, Kentucky. And I heard when I went down there and visited my uncle a couple weeks ago, they, they vote for the local, um, uh, local government, I noticed. And, and it says here, the Amish are more apt to vote when it involves issues that will affect them for, for example, zoning. They got bad roads there, and they got tired of the bad roads, so they started voting out and voting in people that they want to vote that would take care of the roads, which was unheard of in my era. But there is Amish that do that. And the reasons why Amish generally don't vote is they view the, view the world as a material kingdom and, not to, and do not want to conform to it in any way. Because Amish do not enter public office or take positions in government positions, they have less drive to vote. Amish rarely accept government handouts. I know we never accepted government handouts. Um, I heard now in the last five, six years that there's several Amish communities that are taking government handouts, such as food. They take food, they take food from the government that government has to offer like SNAP and all that stuff. Amish do not go to war. Amish believe that by resisting violence and avoiding service in the war, they are following Christ's example by not going to war. They believe that Jesus accepted the beating on the cross, Calvary, without resisting and emulate, uh, emulate this same attitude towards world conflicts. They live by the rule of turning the other cheek rather than killing in war. It's what they live by. By law, Amish must register at, 18, at age 18. And so there's, this just goes on if you want to read in your book there. Then taxes, Amish are required to pay taxes just like any other United States citizens. Now, I know we grew up paying property taxes, but I know that my dad got by with uh, income taxes for many years. But it, they, the federal government cracked down so much now that you have to pay federal income taxes, and you have to pay that. And so dad them them, a lot of Amish did it. They did the Social Security thing. They believed in, a lot of Amish did pay the federal income taxes, but they didn't receive the benefits because they didn't believe that they needed to receive the benefits. Men's hobbies is um, Amish uh, auctions and horse sales. They love, I went too far there. Auctions and horse sales. One of the highlights of the Amish men and the boys was going to horse sales. They love to go to horse sales. They love to go to auctions. They love to go to barn raises. We'd have to get together and raise barns and build houses and all that stuff. And hunting and trapping was a big thing also in the Amish uh, settlements that they, that they liked doing. Women's hobbies, quilting. Amish women pour hours into their quilts in order to show love to family and friends. I know my mom, she made a living off, well, she bought most of our groceries with her quilts that she sold. She always bought and sold quilts, uh, made quilts and sold it my whole life. I just, that's all I remember is her doing quilts. And sometimes they would get together, the women would get together and they would have quiltings and, 
and all that stuff. And then the, and the, one of the things that the women would get together too is noodle making. They like noodle making or some sort of baking or whatever. They'd get together all the time for that. And then cleaning. Whoever would have church at their house the week before that, the family would usually go. Like, for example, my aunt, if she would have uh, church, if they're going to have church one Sunday, the Sunday before that, my mom and her girls, my sisters would go there and they would just clean the whole house inside and out, get everything ready for church. They would call that rich for, rich, rich for church or whatever, get ready for church. So it's not uncommon for mother and daughter, her daughter to get together every month to help each other clean house and do catch-up work. These gatherings are called gluckings or cluckings or whatever that means. So that we know that they would get together and, and, and do that and quilt all the time and, and help one another. And that's the thing that the Amish women don't do. They don't necessarily have jobs in restaurants or any places. They were homemakers. They had to stay home. They taught their children how to do that. And I know that when I married Polly, is that we had that freedom now. She could have had a job if she wanted to. And she said that she would if she knew. I said, no, babe, we're not. As long as I can work and God blesses us work, you can stay home and you can be with the children. And then that's her place. And she said, that's fine. That's what I'll do. And you know what? God has blessed it. Amen. God has blessed it without a shadow of a doubt. God has blessed it. There's just some myth about the Amish. The Amish and the questions that we get asked all the time. Um, the Amish Mafia, is it a real organization? Yes, I was the head of it. No, I'm just kidding. But anyways, uh, most of the stars on the television shows about Amish Mafia are from an Amish background. Thus, they know and understand the culture, how to act out their past lifestyle under the setting they are instructed to do so under. Before there was even an Amish Mafia TV show, I was going around and telling people before I left the Amish that I'm part of the Amish Mafia. Soon after I left, I heard about the Amish Mafia show. I didn't even know that. So they took my show and made, that, made money off of my show. But anyways, myth number two, Amish don't pay taxes, they say. Amish don't pay taxes. We've heard when we moved in here that we brought money in by the suitcases on the trains. This is what, what we were been told by the English people around here, that we came in with trains with suitcases of money in it. I wish that were true because I probably wouldn't be here. No, I'm just kidding. I wish it wouldn't be true. It's not all about money. But anyways, Rome Springer, the third myth is Rome Springer is the age when parents encourage their children to go into the world and sow their wild oats and then when done, come back and settle down. Now, I don't know who always heard about Rome Springer. The translation of Rome Springer is running around, simply running around. And the TV industry has taken that and has made that Rome Springer such a word that it's a bad thing to do bad thing to do, so I got asked so many times when I was Amish, so are you Roma Springer? Do you ever do that Roma Springer thing? So what are you talking about, Roma Springer? And it's like, and, and because it was on TV, and, and, and so I said no, because we were taught that, uh, and there was a community up in uh, Ohio, Ohio and in Indiana, they would let their children leave the Amish, go out and drive, and they would do the drugs and they would come back, and so they would accept and come back. They, find, they were so um, um, I don't know what word to use, but they were okay with it at that point. We never were. We never were okay with that. The Swiss, the, the old, old order Amish, they never were allowed to do that. We never were allowed to do that, and it was not even thought of doing that. Are Amish marriages, are they arranged? Do we get asked. No. I have never experienced that. I've never seen that, although it could have happened. I don't know. I don't know of any Amish that has been married. The young people are encouraged to find their own life partner as long as they marry within the same fellowship of believers and same sect, Amish sect. You know, being a believer today, I believe that we need to uh, uh, be evenly yoked, not even unevenly Amen. yoked. And I believe all that. And I think they take that and they take it out of context, you know, and all that stuff and what they believe. Because I don't, I don't want my daughter just going and marrying a Mormon or going and marrying a Catholic or whatever. I just don't, well, I wouldn't want that to happen. I would encourage her not to and all that. Amish, do they use the banking system? Yes, they use the banking system, but although there's groups that don't. Um, there's a group in Orange County. Amish there, the old order Amish there. It was a guy there that I had, went out there and reached out to. Uh, when I went out to see Joseph and Mary, we went out and saw this guy in Orange County. They don't use banks. He said they don't use banks. They just don't use banks. It's kind of the first I've heard that. But some of them do. We, all, we grew up using bank system all the time. We had to use it or else we wouldn't have been able to get by necessarily. They barely get by. Then uh, myth number seven is, uh, or number six, is uh, the Amish are slowly dying out and becoming extinct. No, they aren't. They're not slowly dying out and becoming extinct. On an average of 80 to 90 percent of teens choose to be baptized and remain in the Amish life. In addition, because of large family sizes, their population decreases on a consistent basis. And you saw me earlier in the earlier presentation that it doubles every 20 years. This is what it is. It doubles every 20 years, and it's by physical birth, not by conversions. 
Number seven, if you're born outside the culture, you cannot join the Amish church. Yeah, it's hard to. They do it, but you're never fully accepted. You're never accepted. I don't care how good you speak their language. I don't care how good you try to act like them and have that accent like Brother Phil have. It doesn't work. You're never fully accepted. And so over the years, quite a few have joined the Amish community. Matter of fact, my great-great-grandfather, his name was Sam Gerard, back in the turn of the century, 1900, he was a Catholic um, gentleman, and he worked for the highway department, and he was working in Adams County, Indiana, in that area, somewhere there, and they slept mostly in Amish homes wherever they could while they were working on the road. It was, motels were very scarce. And he saw this Amish girl, and he fell in love with her. Mary Swartz, I think was her name. He fell in love with her, and he converted over to the Amish. Back in that day, they didn't have a motorized vehicle, so everybody had a horse and buggy, so it wasn't that much of a difference. So he converted to the Amish and let his beard grow out and became an Amish man. His name was Sam Gerard. And so 100 years later, another Sam Gerard leaves the Amish, which is me. Thank God. So anyways, uh, number eight is Amish. Most Amish people are saved. They're just not evangelistic outside their own circle. No. It is true that about maybe, maybe, we speculate about 5 to 10% of the Amish understand salvation and have a clear testimony. Maybe, if that. That's just speculating. We don't know for sure. However, the majority believe that those who are born within the Amish culture must stay with the church in order to please God and gain salvation at death. That's the only time that we think that we can be born again or saved is when we finally meet God when we die on that day. On that day. Is there any questions? That's the end of that session. We're going to go to lunch after this. Any questions? Yes. 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 Amen. Mm-hmm. Amen. 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 Well, if that's it, I think the women got yes, brother Phil. Yes. 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 Right. Amen. 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 So true. Um, I've, uh, over the years, I've talked to a lot of people, and a lot of people have not understood a lot of things and figured out, like, that's the way it is with the Amish. You know, they're just a cult, just like with any other religion. Until I came here talking to Jeremiah and Phil, they've, they've enlightened so much to me knowing that because that is so true. And they've seen it more than anything. And so there is people out there I know that see that, and I'm blessed by that. And I've, I've found comfort in that, knowing that if you're a true born-again believer and you're saved, you're to go out, and you know that. But it's sad that there's a lot of them out there that don't really know. They just don't know. They don't know that. And so that's ultimately why we're here today, and I just want to thank you guys for coming. Yes, Jeremiah.